Okay. Now, the first part of this is very important. What is the evolution of a view? And I've talked about this many times before. So we tend to think that a view is something that we uh, read in a book and then we kind of either understand it or we don't. Like we study philosophy and we read this view, let's say we read the view of emptiness, and then we look at it and we think, oh, I understand that view. So this conceptual understanding of the view is not one's own view. What we talk about one's own view is one's own natural and uncontrived view of the world. It's not like a political opinion, a worldview, a view on religion, etc. This is not it. What it is, is the natural way that we interact and also the way that we experience our world. And again, you can tell this because if somebody says something nasty to you, for example, my videos, I'm always telling you you're lazy and you don't like to study and all this sort of stuff. <laughs> And uh, some people get upset, right? So that's your natural view. Which, what is that? I must protect the self from criticism. So that's a natural view. Okay, so somebody who has a view of no self would not have this view. They would not get upset about somebody criticizing them because there's no me to be criticized, right? So this is the first part, part of this, this question. It's very important. So this evolution of view. What, how does the view evolve? Well, the view evolves through various things, through various mechanisms, but one of those is the progressive path. So as you study, you become kind of more clued up on different viewpoints, and then you can start to see it from other perspectives. And it's possible for your view to evolve merely through study. In fact, many people are influ influenced heavily by books, right? Uh, I think somebody I spoke to recently said when they were young, they read this book called Sophie's World and it kind of changed their worldview. And that, 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 is, that happens a lot, you know, and it's a valid uh, kind of evolution of one's view. Of course, your view can also become corrupted, right? People become corrupted by radicalized influencers, etc. You know, extreme radicalism in religion. And so this is a kind of denigration of your view. It, it becomes worse. So this view changes, and it changes throughout life. For example, when I was young, my view was completely different than my view now. So as this changes, this view, and it can change through study, it can change through practice. So meditation is a great way to change one's view. And when I say meditation is a great way to change one's view, I mean that it's a great way to fundamentally change, change one's uncontrived natural view. More so than study. But you know, what is almost the most influential thing that changes our view is our friends. It's not even our teachers. In fact, our teachers can be sitting there, you know, in a Dharma teaching, and they teach us every day, hours and hours and hours, telling us not to do this, not to do that, you should do virtue and all that. And we go home and it hasn't really changed us. But if our friend says, hey, I got an idea, let's get stoned and really drunk and, you know, <laughs> and go out and do all kinds of crazy things, then we're really ready to do that. Okay, so we're very influenced by our sort of peer circle, our friends, and that's why it's taught in the Buddha Dharma that it's important to associate yourself with good spiritual companions. Associate yourself with people who have got kind of virtuous mindsets and, uh, you know, these sort of benevolent intentions. Okay, so uh, evolution one's view, particular as it relates to family or intimate relationships. This is a huge problem for spiritual practitioners. Uh, because often what happens is that when people start studying meditation, they start going to ashrams, etc., and their view changes, then they start coming into conflict with their own family. And it, especially in the West, um, I mean, it's very common for people to think that you've just basically been sort of drawn into a cult. Especially if you become a monk or a nun. I mean, we've had people like this in the retreat center. There's this one nun, and she's a really lovely person. Uh, she used to have a really good job, you know, like she was kind of involved in judiciary or something like that, a high-level job. And then she became a nun, and her family were just mortified. They just thought she'd, oh no, my daughter's been taken away by a cult. <laughs> and it, and it, it was only once they actually visited the retreat center that they calmed down a little bit. So this is a big problem. 
And likewise, then, if you start following the spiritual path, then you better be careful about what you say in front of your family. Because when you start talking about spiritual things, people start to think you're trying to brainwash them, you know? Especially if you start spouting high views, you start telling people there is no self, and they're going to think, where is this leading, you know? You're, you're, you're trying to trick me into something. So it's, it's really dangerous, and, and it's not really our place to try to influence others, especially in the Buddha Dharma. I mean, in many religions, this sort of ministry and conversion is seen to be very important, but we're not supposed to do that. We're not allowed to. We're not allowed to teach people who haven't got an interest, you know, sincere interest. They, they, they want this information to put it into practice and they have faith in the Buddha Dharma. And if, if they don't, then we're supposed to just keep quiet generally. Uh, family or intimate relationships. You know what? A lot of intimate relationships kind of collapse when one of the partners gets on the spiritual path. And this is mainly when they don't both follow that. If you're a spiritual practitioner and your husband and your wife isn't into that sort of thing, maybe they're kind of very pragmatic and they're kind of have faith in science and they think spirituality is a bit strange, then it could cause big problems in your relationship. My suggestion is that by, through your practice, you should become a better person, you know, kinder, uh, more caring and loving. And through that influence, then your partner is going to see those positive aspects of religion shine through. However, if you go off to some crazy community and you come back talking about all this high level Dharma, like there is no good and bad, and they're going to start to see you like somebody who's like been hypnotized, right? Who's been, you know, hypnotized into some weird cult. And, and you start saying all these things that don't make any sense. And, and they, you shouldn't really go on about this stuff because it's not your natural view, right? You can see because this a partner of yours in this intimate relationship, if they cheat on you, then you're, you're going to get upset, right? So you don't have this view of equanimity. So it's, it's best not to start spouting out the uh, philosophy and rather just try to change your mind. And by doing that, you will naturally have an influence. And this is something that really motivates me to do what I do. It's not easy, you know, sticking yourself up there on YouTube to be a target for other people's derision. Uh, I mean, also you get a lot of praise and also praise itself is very difficult to deal with. There's a great danger of becoming corrupted, you know. I get really lovely comments from people on YouTube and it really touches my heart, but I'm really afraid of that because I'm just an ordinary human being and I could get carried away with that and start become an egomaniac. And also I'm a bit worried that the only reason why I do this is because I'm a bit of a narcissist. <laughs> so that's, I, I, I think I'm quite well motivated, but you never know. And then all this kind of praise and stuff, it doesn't do you any good if you're already an egomaniac. So you're better off to try to change yourself and become a better person. I mean, that's the first step in the spiritual path, right? It's become a better person. And through that, you will naturally influence people. I find as my view changes, my conduct is also changing. So this person has understanding of the spiritual path, much more so than many. There's this link between view, conduct, and meditation I've spoken to about many times before. And so what we try to do is we try to contrive our view or we try to contrive our conduct. So we think, I'm a Buddhist now, I need to shave my head, I need to take vows. But basically, deep down inside, I don't want to keep these vows, but I'm taking them because that's what I should do, right? And I should also speak like I've got this high view because I, that's what I read in the books. So I have to, I'm a Buddhist now, I've got to pretend I've got the Buddhist view, I've got to pretend I've got Buddhist conduct. And, and this is mistaken, but uh, with this uh, questioner, puts here in her question is, I find as my view changes, my conduct is also changing. And this is correct. As your natural view evolves through your study and your meditation, then your conduct will also follow suit. And how is that? Well, let's look at it very simply. As you start to understand emptiness and no self, then you lose a lot of this self-clinging, yeah? And also clinging to me and mine. And on the basis of that, you become a more generous person. You become uh, less avaricious less desirous, and also you don't get angry so much. So this is a natural process, and this is what we're after. We're not after looking in a book, what does it say here? Okay, I'm a Buddhist, I have to believe this. Theravadins, okay, they keep really good conduct. Oh, Zen, oh, I quite like Zen, they've got really cool robes. <laughs> you know, we were like that. <laughs> and, then, and then we think, oh yeah, this master in the past, well, look what he said, that's really cool. And we, we think we can just adopt that because it resonates with us, but it's not like that. You've got to kind of change yourself, and your view will naturally evolve as you change. 
Particularly with a troubled family member, I sometimes feel pain at what the person says and how she addresses me. Uh, but I'm not inclined to attempt to change her view or even respond. Yeah, you shouldn't be inclined to try to change somebody else's view. It's dangerous. I mean, spiritual teacher, that's their job, right? That's not an easy thing. And things can go wrong as well. So basically you should, uh, what we say is don't get involved. Don't interfere. But also the other thing is you have to never lose your compassion. So the main thing is you've got to change yourself, but also you've got to keep this love and compassion in your heart. Like thinks about people, identifies their suffering and feels genuine compassion for them. Can you speak about how to deal with this other than trying not to feel pained? Yeah, this is a problem. You can't try not to feel pained. That's very contrived. I mean, we do have to contrive our practice in general, but sort of trying to convince yourself that you're not upset is not so useful. The more sort of efficacious path to take is to recognize that you're pained or you're upset. That's really the, the crux of the issue here in our practice, is to recognize what our natural view is, uh, how we see the world, and also to notice our negative emotions. And as you meditate, as you develop mental acuity, you'll become more sensitive to that. So people often find when they start meditating is they're like, wow, I started meditating, now I've got even more thoughts than before. This isn't working. But that's a sign that your meditation is working. What's happening is you're becoming more sensitive to how you feel and how you think. And that's a really positive sign. So you can't really, don't try to make yourself feel pain. I mean, that's the worldly way of doing things. Oh, I'm sad today. I think I'll go watch a movie. This distracting yourself is what we call kind of neutral, creating neutral karma. It's kind of a waste of time. You're better off investing yourself in future karma and positive karma and avoiding negativity. Or distancing myself from her interaction or from interactions with her. Well, you have to, you have to play, it, play, play it by ear here. Sometimes you need to distance yourself, but you should always be there for other people, especially if you're a spiritual practitioner. If people know, you know, maybe the best thing to do is just not to let anybody know you're a meditator. But if people know you're a meditator and a spiritual practitioner, then you should always have this kind of outward kind of, it's not really a facade, but you have to show this willingness to be there for them. Because what you'll find is that people will be attracted to you when they're suffering. They'll know that you're a spiritual person, you're a meditator. And so at times they will be looking for your support. We're always aware of people who have this sort of spiritual experience, you know, like in India, when you see holy men, etc. then it kind of changes our perspective. This individual sort of exists in a different context in my environment, right? So when we see a police officer, we have a particular way of relating to them, or a businessman, somebody at the bank, but also when we see a monk or a sort of Baba, a spiritual ascetic, then we relate to this as somebody who is seeking transcendence. And that naturally opens us up to them. So you should always be there for them and just be there for them and hold compassion in your heart. And that will be the most kind of effective thing. Okay, my question. As a layperson who meditates for 30, 40 minutes twice a day, what should my focus during meditation be? So it's not really, uh, you know, it's, it, you can't really ask